This week we're going to start talking about Christ in all of Scripture. You've learned how to interpret individual passages in the Bible, but you haven't really finished interpreting a passage until you can figure out where it fits in the overall story of the Bible. Uh, it's kind of like the illustration, if you've gotten this far in Vaughn Roberts' God Big, God's Big Picture. He tells about two boys that were putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And they knew that it was a picture of a king, but they just couldn't make the pictures, the pieces fit in the right places. And so finally they turned over the front of the box and they looked at the picture and they saw what it was supposed to look like when it was finished. And one of the boys said, oh, the king's in the middle. And that's what Bible interpretation is like. You know that there are a lot of different pieces. You may have Exodus 18 or Psalm 23 or Matthew 15 or whatever passage but you don't really know how it fits into the big picture until you see the big picture and see, oh, King Jesus is in the middle of it all. And the whole Bible, in one way or another, is about Jesus. To make this point, I've had this class use an online resource before, but it became prohibitively expensive. And I've had this class read a book by Graham Goldsworthy, which was good, but it was a little technical. And then I was reading the introduction in this book, and Von Roberts said, my book is like some of the writings of Graham Goldsworthy, only it's less technical. And I thought, well, that's perfect. And so I think that this ought to give you a really nice introduction to what the big picture of the Bible is so that you can then put your individual passages into the right context. Uh, Roberts' overall point is that you can't understand the passages in the Bible until you understand the overall story of the Bible, which is really the same with any book you read. You can't pick up a novel and understand one page unless you understand the big story. Same with the Bible. It's no different. Now, I want to give you a couple of different ways to think about the big story of the Bible. One way to think about the Bible story is in four movements or four sections. The story of the Bible is about creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. The creation, of course, is how God made the universe from nothing and made it good and put man right at the center of that creation. But then man disobeyed the one rule that God gave him, and that was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the fall. And because man did that, every single part of God's good creation was marred. Relationships between humans are marred. Uh, work it was no longer purely a joy, but work became burdensome. And in fact, the creation worked against the man and the woman as they worked. Uh, the woman had pain in childbearing. And there wasn't a single part of life that wasn't touched and somehow ruined because of that fall. That's the second big plot movement in the Bible. But then you have redemption. And redemption is the process of God gradually fixing his creation and using his people to do that, and undoing all the damage that came because of the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Now, when you think about redemption, most of the Bible is the story of redemption. The first promise of redemption is in Genesis 3, right after man and woman fell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right after man and woman fell, God made a promise that we'll look at in a few minutes, uh, that there's going to be someone born from woman who bruises the head of the serpent and undoes the curse that Satan brought into this world and starts to fix everything. And from that point on, God's people started to look for this one that would fix the problems. God gives more and more hints. Later he says that it's Abraham's family that's going to help reverse the curse. Then he says it's a king from the line of David, even within Abraham's family. And then the prophets start to tell us more and more about the identity of this person. And all the while, God's using the nation of Israel, his chosen people, to begin to redeem and fix this fallen world. Through the New Testament, Jesus comes, and he is the one that's going to fix it. It's another part of redemption. And then Jesus establishes the church, his people. And God begins to fix the broken creation, beginning with his church. He makes his people new, and he puts a heart in them that wants to obey. And then he gives them a mandate to go out and to impact the culture around them and, and be salt and light to reverse this decay. All of that, most of the Bible, is the story of redemption, God's process of beginning to fix this broken world. 
And then the last movement of the Bible's plot is restoration. That's when Jesus comes back and he fully and finally completes the work of undoing the fall and making the creation perfect, everything God intended it to be. So when you think about the Bible's overall story, remember, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Now, as you read Von Roberts, uh, you will see him tell this same story. He, he does speak about those four movements. That's not exactly what he emphasizes, but keep in mind, he's not saying anything different than what I told you. He's just looking at it from a different angle. What Robert says is, if you want to sum up the Bible's story in one phrase, it's the kingdom of God. What's the Bible about? Robert says it's about the kingdom of God, and there are four elements of God's kingdom. Robert says God's kingdom is about God's people being in God's place, under God's rule, with God's king. And in every section of the Bible, we see that story worked out. And you're going to read the first four chapters this week, and they'll show you how that theme of the kingdom of God is worked out in the first four sections of the Bible. For instance, Robert's first chapter after the preface and introduction is about creation in Genesis 1 and 2. And he says this is the pattern of the kingdom. Because in Genesis 1 and 2, you have God's people, Adam and Eve, and they're in God's place, the Garden of Eden, and, the, and God is ruling over them. He gave them the one rule, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God himself was their king and they walked in fellowship with him and that's the pattern of the kingdom. That's what God's aiming for with his whole plan for human history. But then in the second chapter, uh, Roberts talks about the fall, the perished kingdom. And in that you still see in the fall of Genesis 3, you still see the four elements of the kingdom. You have God's people, but their relationship with God and their relationship with one another is broken. They're no longer in God's place, the Garden of Eden. The place has been marred. The people have been marred and tainted. The place has been marred and tainted. And they rebel against God's rule. That's marred and tainted. After Adam and Eve sinned, every single human is born with a tendency toward corruption. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to steal or lie. That just comes naturally because... God's rule is something humans rebel against. And God is still the king of his people after the fall. But again, it's a, it's a kingly rule that humans rebel against. So the fall messed up every aspect of the kingdom of God. And, and Robert shows that in Genesis 3. Then he has a chapter about the, the first hint of redemption in Genesis 3.15. It's, I referenced this earlier, but I'll read you the verse now. In Genesis 3.15, God's talking to the serpent, and he, which, who is Satan, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the first hint that God's going to come and restore each aspect of the kingdom that's been broken by the fall. And as we go through Genesis, we start to see hints of God's restoring grace everywhere. After Cain kills his brother Abel, God tells Cain, I'm going to put a mark on you so that no one will kill you, even though you deserve it. God's redeeming grace. In Genesis 5, there's a genealogy, and it, it says of everyone, he died. But then in the middle of it, there's a man named Enoch, and it doesn't say that he died. It just says he walked with God, and then he was not, because God took him. And it's this beautiful picture of someone who doesn't taste death because God redeems him and he fixes that curse for this one man that walked with God. We see the same with Noah. There's a broken creation all around Noah, but we see God's redeeming hand on Noah and he begins to fix the effects of the fall in the life of Noah and his family so that they're set apart and different from than this broken, corrupt world. And then finally, at the end of the first section of Genesis, God makes a promise to a man named Abraham. He comes to him. Abraham was a pagan who didn't deserve God's grace, but the Lord appeared to him. And God said, Abraham, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish my kingdom through you and your descendants. He told Abraham, your, your people, your descendants are going to be my people. I'm going to give you a land, my place. I'm going to put you under my rule, and I'm going to be your king. And, and then the final chapter you'll read this week is about Genesis 12, through the book of Second Chronicles, which is a huge section of Scripture, but uh, Roberts calls this the partial kingdom. After God makes his promise to Abraham, then he builds Abraham's descendants as the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is really the first uh, unified, corporate, national uh, representation of God's kingdom. Because the, 
Israel is God's people. They end up living in God's place, the promised land. Uh, God gives them his law in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then eventually God gives them an earthly king. God's their king, but he also gives them an earthly king to represent God. And when you have the kingdom of Israel established, and then when it gets to its height under David and Solomon, you finally start to see uh, God's, God's fixing of the fall take shape. Because now you have a, a people of God that are obeying him and prospering, and they're living in a promised land, which is a good land. Uh, they have God's law, and they're following it in really important ways. And they have a king in David and in Solomon, who for the most part is righteously ruling over them. And it looks like the fall is finally starting to get fixed. Now, next week, we'll see that God's people disobey, and it looks like his plan is going to be thwarted. But he, he puts it on track again and makes a covenant that's even better than the one he made with Israel. This is a lot of information to take in, but what I'm trying to give you is an overview and an introduction to the big story of the Bible, so that when you encounter any passage of Scripture, you'll be able to situate it in the big story of the Bible. So I thought about a passage like 2 Samuel 7, where God makes a promise to David that I'm going to put one of your descendants on your throne and he's going to reign forever. And that passage, you can know the grammar, uh, you can apply the rules of historical narrative to it, but until you know the big story of the Bible, you can't interpret that passage because uh, you don't know that God's promised a redemption and that it's going to come through David's family. And if you don't know the story of the Bible, you might not know that that promised eternal king is Jesus. It's the same with every passage you'll study. You're going to miss something about that passage if you're not able to situate it in the overall story of the Bible. Let me say one last word to you. Uh, as you read this, these chapters, at the end of every chapter, there's a Bible study that you can do. Uh, I highly recommend that you look at these Bible studies and actually work through them. For your discussion question this week, you're going to have to actually do one of the Bible studies, which won't take you very long, and tell the most important point that you learned. But please, as we finish out this course, don't coast. Really put your all into this because the Bible is about Jesus. And I want you to be able to see how every passage relates to him.